Okay. Again, welcome to World Exchange Investor Office Hours. I am Anthony Bruno, Director of Communications here. Again, we have our usual panel of experts on the call. We've got Matthew Smith, our CEO. We've got Rob Bernard, our General Counsel. And we've got Reiner Connor, our Financial Analyst. So uh, today, what we're going to start off by doing, before we get to your questions, uh, we are going to start off just by going to have Ryan basically go over a little bit about some listings that we have on the site that are what I would just define as not traditional or sort of outlier uh, listings. By that, I mean basically listings for assets that are not music related. We've been talking a lot about music assets and how they earn and music industry concepts and things like that. And we'll continue to answer those questions today, of course. But I think it would be nice just to kind of uh, raise the idea that we do occasionally have uh, royalties assigned for other types of um, uh, of entertainment content or, or even trademark content. And Ryan's going to kind of give you a quick rundown about how maybe you can um, evaluate those and how you can you know, draw the parallels between those evaluations and other things on our site. So we'll start with that. And then, of course, we'll get into the questions that were left in advance. And of course, at all, as always, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to type in any questions at any time, and we'll get to those uh, after we go through the, uh, the questions left in advance. So with that, uh, Ryan, I'm going to hand it over to you and let you take it away. Great. Thank you, Andy, and uh, good morning, everyone. And um, as uh, Andy was saying, we, you know, we do from time to time get these um, royalties that are outside the music industry um, listed on our site. And I mean, we certainly love working with those and try to get them as often as we can. And, you know, the, the one kind of the main difference or the one thing you really want to look for is kind of read the text of those listings because they do have some um, differences that you need to look into. I believe Andy is going to show the Ben and Jerry's royalties here in a moment that sure. we we've done. And I, you know, something like with that one, there was in particular um, like this. So this is administered by, um, I believe it's uh, Unilever. And so like one sort, one kind of uh, difference here is that they actually have the right to not renew this royalty, which then, so, so that's going to bring me to, to the point is with these kind of, with these different royalties, you really want to, you know, what test or, you know, identify the strength of the underlying brand. So, I mean, this one's Cherry Garcia, Ben and Jerry's, right? as long as I've been alive, this has been available, right? It's something that's um, well known. You see it in every grocery store. And so you really want to um, have that, that brand strength in something like this, this type of product or, or trademark or um, some of our film royalties in particular. Um, so one of them is we did the trading places as well, certainly. Again, a high brand name film, um, you know, everyone or, pretty much everyone knows that this, you know, about this film or has heard something um, from it. I've, before I even saw the film, I heard a quote from this film, right? Um, things like that. So again, you want to read that listing. You want to make sure you understand those differences, those kind of, um, the, that, um, those um, unique risks to the asset that may not be there with the music royalties that you're used to seeing um, or that you're used to purchasing. Uh, that sort of thing. You want to be able to test, uh, I say test, but um, you want to really think about the brand strength or, or the kind of the royalty strength. Um, so, you know, a, a couple other things you want to look at. Again, I, I look at the, the re release of those royalties or kind of the uh, original or the um, the original like or origin date of those royalties of when they started. Um, because again, that's going to, as you know, Matt talks about a lot, the Lindy effect, you know, whatever has existed for X amount of years is likely to continue to exist for the same amount of years going forward. Um, additionally, you really want to look at the variability of these royalties. That's, that's something else I, I like to look at um, and, and kind of gauge it to your risk tolerance. You know, are they bouncing around a lot? Are they, you know, are they pretty consistent? Like I believe the Ben and Jerry's were very consistent um, and actually growing, right? So certainly, you know, um, additional things that you want to be aware of and certainly, you know, uh, take into consideration and, you know, when evaluating these and, and um, with the, the trading places one in particular, right? When I first saw this one close, I thought that 
I was like, oh, wow, uh, just looking at a multiple basis, right? And, and this is really going to kind of highlight the, the downside to using a multiple. Um, you know, I, I, I saw it right, right off the bat. I looked at it as like someone overpaid for this. But really, when you, when you look at it. Because they paid uh, about 17 times last year's earnings, something yeah. like that, right, Ryan? Yeah, yeah correct. Yeah. 140. Um, and- 140,000 and it starting in the last, last 12 months was seven, just about 8,000. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, but when you, so you break it down, right, you look to it as a multiple basis and you think, oh, someone overpaid for this. But when you look at it on a yield basis, right, it, as long as the royalties stay somewhat consistent, you're getting about, I think it was 5.71, roughly 6% yield on this, on this asset. I mean, you look other places, it's like, you know, where, where else are you going to get that 6% yield? Um, you know, with, but, even, with, but, but this asset is one that we looked at is compared to most of the catalogs of anything, whether it be film royalties or music royalties, it was one of the highest multiple things that's ever transacted on our, in our marketplace. And we looked at it as being incredibly expensive and, and, uh, um, and yet it's still, because these assets are so still sort of below the radar, it's still, even this dramatically, we thought overpaid for asset was still generating an almost 6% yield. Exactly. Right. And, and that's the, that's kind of the downside of using a multiple, just a multiple basis when evaluating a purchase, right? Cause I mean, it, you want to evaluate it on a yield basis in the yield that you require, right? Your yield's not going to be the same as everyone else's or, or what you're going to um, expect to receive. Um, the other thing with film royal film and TV royalties in particular, you really want to, um, it, you really want to see like the, the notoriety of the kind of the film or the TV show, right? Uh, what's going to keep these royalties going are going to be those video streaming services. And if it's not something that's going to be able to be placed on those, or, you know, once it's dropped off on Netflix, it needs to be able to be picked up on something else to really keep those royalties flowing. So you want to look at it and something like friends, right? That is always is most likely always going to be picked up on Amazon, Hulu, um, Netflix, whatever else is to come. I believe it's, it's Peacock now with NBC. Um, so, you know, that's a certainly another thing. And that goes along with the, the brand strength or the uh, trademark strength that the, the asset provides. So yeah, the risk has- is with the risk is with a, a lot of these, you look at like the, the Ben and Jerry's ones, for example, is that um, all you need is Ben and Jerry's to decide. It's just one party can decide, um, you know what, we don't really want to carry this, this product anymore. And so uh, thus the royalties sort of end. And um, you know, it, as compared to with music, the distribution is so broad based and it's so driven by kind of consumer and fan demand across all these different platforms that it's, it's a lot more resilient to a single, you know, it's not going to be, it's not going to end because of a single choice that one creative director might make, for instance. Um, so, so you want to look for, and this is where the brand power comes in, you know, as, as Ryan was saying, I mean, uh, you know, Cherry Garcia is going to be around for a long time. Is probably as long as Ben and Jerry's is around. Uh, Cherry Garcia is going to be around. It's you know, I think their best-selling um, flavor of ice cream. You know, mm-hmm. um, so but there is a risk with that. There's a risk with that that's different than the risk that you have with with maybe a music catalog. But um, in that, you know, one decision could cause the brand to to fall away and uh, the, and the trademark royalties to stop. Um, with trading places and with film royalties, it's uh, it's a little bit more like music in that um, you know it, uh, the on-demand services are there and it does you know trading places is a is a is a holiday film of sorts so you, you know it so it gets it gets replayed on you know the the broadcast networks or the, the cable television networks also every year around around Christmas time and um, you know assuming that trend continues on uh, then these royalties should be pretty stable. So let's jump in. If I'm hearing everyone correctly, just to kind of summarize a little bit, mm-hmm. in terms of valuating the the, uh, the underlying asset, basically, it's not too much different in, in that you still want to look at the you know the length of time that the earnings yeah. have been around, and you want to also examine the sources of those royalties, mm-hmm. and and those are the two factors that you're evaluating. And so, um, just first of all, make sure that I'm summarizing that correctly. I think that's, that's right. right. I think that's right. Yeah. Just the risk factors are different with these Correct. because of those sources of income than they would be with the music catalog. Would that, would you okay. agree with that, Ryan? Yeah, exactly. A hundred percent. I mean, the, the main difference is going to be those unique risks. 
And now the other thing is just in terms of as the, as you're looking as an investor at the listing itself, uh, you know, we're, we don't have a live listing in this regard right now. So it's a little bit limiting because once the auctions mm -hmm. close, there's less, like I can't access the raw data file, for instance, now mm -hmm. because it's closed. But when it's live, there is a raw data file and you'll be able to see more of these things just like you walked through, uh, I think in a prior office hour session, there, those raw data mm -hmm. files would exist. But we don't, but, we don't necessarily have a, a, a metric like dollar age in that listing. Correct. Yeah. And so like, we'll put like release year, something like that, like when it was released. Um, so you can tell because I mean, a lot of these, it's not like a bundle of, you know, like, so music royalty is going to be a bundle of different tracks. And, and the whole point of dollars is kind of the way the, the age of those different tracks with how much they earned in the last 12 months and come up with kind of a number that summarizes that with these is going to be that one asset, right? So it's very easy. You know, it was released in 2000. It's 20 years old that, you know, it makes it very easy um, for the, for the investor to kind of evaluate. Now the raw data will certainly be on there due to the, due to the, like the intricacies of these, of, of the level of data varies, right? It, it, you know, it, it may not, you're not, you may not be able to see like exactly how many streams something had on Netflix or um, with the Ben and Jerry's, you're not going to get the per sale, you know, store by stores, stuff like that. You might just get high level numbers. Yeah. You Unilever know, considers that proprietary data. They, so exactly. they only share a certain amount in the, in the, in the, uh, in the reports that they share. So this does vary by asset completely. And you know, we do have a, uh, a film asset that we expect uh, it's in our pipeline that we expect will be hitting the marketplace in the, in, in sometime in the near future. And, you know, it has some different, some totally different dynamics than a music catalog and that, you know, the streaming services are a big source of the revenue for it. And, uh, you know, as you see these assets come up, if you have questions about them in particular, just remember to ask us and we can, we can help share. We'll, we try to make clear in every listing, really all of the information that we have about it um, in a way that it's clear and concise. And so people can make reasonable decisions, but when it's a unique asset, uh, it's totally understandable that you'd have a different set of questions and just reach out. We're happy to answer every, I mean, we're an open book when it comes to any of these things and we'll answer every question you have. And also just to, just to, to quickly jump onto that is that, if, you know, for some of these questions, if they're, if they're not able to be added to the list, listing after the fact, I'll make sure that we notify anyone who's registered for the auction of any new information that was generated from a singular investor's question so that all yep. investors can share the same, right. even if they hadn't thought of the question themselves. I think that's important to note. Yep. And, and just one other thing I was gonna mention about these is usually when we have these unique assets, they are pr premium assets, right? And, and they're going to go for higher multiples um, than what you're going to see on the music royalty side. So I, I, would, I would advise, like shy away from just using it as a multiple basis. Um, and, you know, and just understand that it is going to be a premium asset trading places, Ben and Jerry's, right? Those are two very well-known things that aren't like our everyday music catalogs. Um, yeah. So be prepared to, you know, to get into that kind of that bidding competition and to pay a little bit more on a multiple basis. Yeah, I mean, trading places is from 1983. Yeah. I mean, that's a, I'm pretty sure that's way before you were born, Ryan. <laughs> yes. Not before. I Great asset. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Please. Exactly. That's the. I remember seeing it in the movie theaters. Far too uh, young to be seeing a movie like that in the movie theaters, which we yeah. learned very, very quickly. But that aside, I, I have one last question. Sorry. Uh, one of the questions we get a lot on these office hours calls from investors tends to be uh, after the closing of the auction and the um, the level of risk, or at least the certainty of receiving the proceeds after the sale. Now, in the music side of things, we've we've been very. Um, clear about the, you know, the very secure and very standardized way that music royalties are collected and distributed and have been for many, many years. I guess maybe we should at least talk a little bit about that with regard to these types of assets. Um, I actually don't know the answer to this. So I, Rob, know, do you want to talk about uh, trading places or, uh, or the Ben and Jerry's one as examples? Sure. You just mean as far as what, how the, how the payments flow after an auction happens? Exactly. Really Really, it's, it's, it's really the same, you know, what we, do, we run through the same procedures as we do with the music catalog is ahead of time, we'll go to whoever the distributor of the royalties are. Um, so we'll check with them. Okay, so is this asset capable, capable of being transferred? Um, you know, who is going to be paying the royalties on what frequency? Um, and the, it, again, with music royalties, what you're, you're buying is the right, 
regardless of who is paying it. So if, for example, um, trading places, you know, the, the, the movie gets purchased by a different studio, well, you're still going to get paid um, by the new, the new studio, whoever, whoever is, is in charge of uh, collecting the royalties uh, would have to pay those through to you. So part of our normal due diligence process with any of these is that we confirm that the asset, the income stream essentially can be transferred and, um, understand, and then we, we, we make sure we understand what that process is, the payment schedule and so forth. And then we, we file that transfer request essentially with, it, with that distributor and uh, to make sure that subsequent payments ultimately end up in the new investor's hands. All right, great. Well, I think that covers sort of the, the outlier um, auctions. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's worth bringing up because they are, they usually wind up having a lot more questions around them because they are a little bit different than what you normally see on our platform. Uh, I think the fact that we do have one in the near term pipeline coming up, I thought my, this was a good time to, you know, get into it now uh, in anticipation of that. Um, and then I think, barring any other questions, I think we'll go over into the, uh, the, the questions that's in advance now, if you guys are ready for that. Um, so, First question, awesome, right? Very, very foundational question that we usually get. When valuating an asset on the marketplace, what are certain indicators that tell you that, it, that it's a great return on investment? Ryan, do you wanna go? Yeah, um, well, so I mean, the, the, the things you're gonna evaluate again, dollar age source, um, and you know, what's the historical trend of the catalog? Um, Let's explain dollar age real quick because some people might be listening to this call for the first time. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. So dollar age again, it's it's just going to be it's a weighted average age of um, each song in the catalog and what each song has earned in the last twelve months to kind of give you a general view of how old the last twelve months earnings are. Yeah, and so we basically the way we think of it is that uh, it's almost a it's it's a pretty good heuristic for the qualitative nature of the of the income stream. Uh, qualitative meaning the longer it's been paying, the more likely it's going to be paying into the future and, and generally the less volatility it's going to experience. So the higher the dollar age, um, I look personally at that catalog as, uh, you know, a, a, a catalog that has a 10 year dollar age, I look at as substantially lower risk than a catalog with a three year dollar age, for instance. So dollar age is we find to be one of the, one of the most critical components toward understanding a catalog. And it's just based upon the simple idea that uh, the longer uh, a catalog has been earning, the more likely it is going to continue to earn into the future. So that's, that's I think, criteria number one that everyone should look at. It's listed in every auction. It's listed in the secondary market. It's one of the key columns you can sort catalogs by is dollar age. And we, we definitely encourage you to think from that reference point of dollar age to understand the different catalogs. So that's number one. Ryan, what beyond that? And so, you know, beyond that is going to be your source and your historical trend of the source, you know, look for those streaming sources, you want them to make up a decent amount. Say, again, I look for at least 30% or more, but you know, we just had one and that was making up 93%, right? Um, and you want in that historical trend, right? Uh, you want to be aware of that, um, you know, if it's a downward trend, you know, be aware of that, you know, put that into your models or your, your forecast. If it's an upward trend, again, same thing. Um, and then, I mean, the last thing is that's going to drive your return is obviously going to be the price that you pay for it, right? So don't get caught up in the bidding. Um, if it's something that's, you know, if it's a price that's making you uncomfortable, maybe it's best to, you know, back away from from the bidding or, or as Matt always says, you know, size your positions correctly, that it will make you comfortable. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think that's the best way to answer that question. The next one up is uh, how to minimize tax. Uh, and I guess that means once you've acquired the asset and they're earning income from the asset, how to minimize the taxes you then pay on that income. And Rob, you want to jump in here on that one, perhaps? Sure. Yeah. And I think maybe we should just probably pre-record a, we are not tax advisors. We're not giving you tax advice. Um, we're well, also can, not financial advisors. We're not financial, financial advice. Exactly. So yeah. So, so uh, never, yeah. Ne never ask a lawyer a question. It's just <laughs> yeah. So, but no, I mean, there's some general things that, that we have seen investors do that, that, I'd be happy to at least give you broad strokes and you could take it to your tax advisor and see if it makes sense for you. Um, so actually on the, on the front end, we've had a few folks purchase through a self-directed IRA. 
um, that's one way to, to handle a purchase that would uh, put it in a, in a tax advantage account for you. Um, what I would say around that is, is if you're thinking about that, you want to get pre-approved with, with your uh, IRA company and us so we could provide whatever information they need for that because it does take some time to, to get in that system. And, um, you know, we have a pretty tight closing window, so we want to make sure you get that uh, handled uh, ahead of time, which is better. So, um, so that's on the purchase end. Then on the back end, you know, royalties are, are generally perceived or you know, classified as ordinary income. Um, there are some, some options you may have as far as amortization um, on that purchase. Um, but again, you can check with your tax advisors, see if that's something that's uh, available to you and, and makes sense for, for your situation. And when you, uh, when you do sell the, the royalties, if you, if you buy a, um, you know, life of rights catalog and then you sell it in the future, it's a, it's generally considered a capital gain when it's sold. Uh, so it's, so there's that, those are the primary ways it's taxed. Great. And I think, uh, if you go to our, uh, our website to the blog section, there's an investor uh, blog. If it's called investor resources and in there, there's an article that we posted that digs into some of the tax strategies that uh, we've heard before that's worth uh, looking for. And if, and if anyone on the call can't find or need in particular, just uh, again, send a note to investors at royaltyexchange.com. I'll be happy to send you the link. Um, all right, next question then. How can I track sales and streams? Well, uh, I'm assuming the question is relating to if you bought a catalog, how do I, how do you track everything that's happening with the music that you acquired to know that you're being paid properly? Um, it's very, very difficult to track all of this. Fortunately, the distributors, uh, whether it's ASCAP, BMI, uh, uh, one of the music publishers and music labels, they do collect all this information uh, and they, in the, um, in the account statements that you receive on a quarterly or a, a semi-annual basis, they, they share all that information with you. So you find out exactly the royalties that are earned and on what basis they were earned and you get a full breakdown. So fortunately you don't have to keep track of that. Um, it's kept track for on the distributors who have, a, you know, have the uh, obligation and a vested interest themselves and making sure that all that's tracked properly. Yeah, and again, um, on our account management side, you know, they do a great job. And, you know, we, having reviewed the catalog before we listed it, if we see anything that looks off or um, is deviating from, from a trend, we will, we will certainly look into that and make sure that there's, there's no foul play or, or however you want to put it. Yeah, and from a post-sale uh, perspective, that's, that's one of the benefits of having Royalty Exchange administer the payments from the distributors to you as an investor is that we've, we've got a, a bird's eye view on a lot of the act of, of, of what's being paid and what's happening. And it makes it a little bit easier for us to identify any potential errors or outliers that require, you know, any kind of further investigation. So that's, that's on the post-sale side. On the pre-sale side, um, we do list, again, the financials in the listing in terms of how it's been earning. In terms of the actual, like, number of specific streams, I don't believe that's something that's available uh, in the listing, but it's, I think it's really more the, the, the financial compensation for the streams than the actual number of streams themselves. Yeah, so, and most, in the raw data file, most of the distributors will list actually how many streams oh, are there. So okay. Um, okay. if you'd like to do that, that detailed uh, level of analysis, it's certainly available. All right, and since we're, since we're on this topic, I'm gonna skip, it's, it's, it's a little bit further down the list of questions, but I, I thought it was an interesting uh, question anyway, which was, uh, where is it exactly about, genre how do i try and find the, the question here now i can't find the question but i think there was a question how do i how do i evaluate genres in terms oh, of was, uh, uh, what model and database exists to yeah that's it profitability of certain genres of songs yes yes so we just i think it's kind of along the same lines of questions basically um I just for my own, I could just start off the, the answer by just saying that um, there are outlets that help you track um, relative popularity of genre it, it, across the music industry. Uh, Chart Metric is one. They just actually put one out that's looking at which genres are certainly currently seeing more activity as a result of people at home and things like that. So you'll see some studies like that. You can look at the um, both the IFPI, which is the worldwide uh, recording music uh, association that that does an annual report. 
uh, and they'll look at the overall ranking of genre popularity. RIAA does the same thing. Um, there's a there's a service called Buzz, not not Buzzsumo. What's the other one called? Um, there's Buzz another one that just changed their name, Buzz, Buzz Angle, but they changed their name. I can't remember what they changed their name to. But anyway, Buzz Angle, if you look that, you find the new company. They also do it. The only thing is that all that's telling you is vaguely how popular that genre is relative to other genres. I'm not sure it's actually helping you forecast any profitability. I don't know, Ryan, if you want to take the, the profitability. Part. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the that's the gist of it, right? You can, it, we'll give you the historical trend and how they performed and, you know, you can make your assumptions, you know, from there on out. I mean, uh, pr profitability is kind of a, I mean, that's like hard to assess. I mean, a lot of these royalties are also off the top line, right? Like, so. Um, yeah, profitability is really hard to assess in looking at the external databases because the, you know, the, the key, the numerator there sort of, you know, is the, what you pay for it. And that's of course not included in any of that. Um, also, most of the, the, the databases that are out there are, they're, they're around consumption. And so the, the consumption doesn't necessarily clearly tie to the revenue uh, derived from it. So um, obviously it's, it's indicative of the, the trend, the direction of the revenue, but it is not, it's, it's not precise enough to, uh, to build a model around. Yeah. I mean, and just, I mean, if you have, if you, you buy something in a genre, that's the fastest growing genre for the next five years, probably going to make more money from those royalties. I mean, I think that's the best way to look at it. But it's also important to tie at the source, right? Like one of the right. things we note in the listings is that like, obviously hip hop and streaming have a very you know tight relationship, let's say, right? But sometimes you go into a, like a country catalog and you want to look more closely or at least uh, consider differently the radio uh, royalty stream because right. country tends to have a longer staying power on radio than, than yeah. other genres might. And we tend to note those things in the listing. We try to draw those, uh, connect those dots for you to the best degree we can. Um, and then if those, and if, and in those notes, we will link to the report that told us this, and then you can, you can dig into it further. Uh, that's usually helpful as well. So look at the key drivers within the individual listings, because it's really important to understand that while genre in general is very helpful, really comes down to the individual song. I mean, there's, there's plenty of the, yeah. the catalog rather, because there's always outliers, right? Some, some songs just, ex, you know, exist beyond any rule of genre. And that's just how that goes. All right, moving on. Um, we, we already kind of ta tagged uh, on this a little bit, but I want, you might as well answer it uh, to find a, some extra details. Uh, it says, if I don't understand the music business, how am I able to select the best investment? And I think that goes back to dollar age and we can maybe talk about how standard orders work a little bit too. Yeah, I think, I think the, uh, go ahead, Ryan, I'll let you answer first. Oh, I was going to say that just goes back to evaluating the financials um, of it. You know, look at the financials of the catalog, look at the dollar age of the catalog comes out. I mean, you know, you say you don't understand the music industry. Well, you under, it's wi widely known that if you're not, if you don't have a streaming catalog in most cases, probably not going to be, I don't want to say a great investment, but not, you know, not going to be as good as other ones that do have streaming. Um, yeah. I think, I think with all this, it's really important to not look at the, it's like, it's like talking about investing in the stock market as a whole, you know, you can't, it's just, it's just too, too broad of a topic to even say, is it a good idea to invest in the stock market? Uh, I, you know, I, and I think the same is with music royalties, you have to look on a catalog specific basis and, you know, with each, uh, each asset that's up for listing. Um, I mean, the, you know, the positive thing about music in general is that the, the streaming bull market is still on. And because of that, the music business is still growing. So it has a nice tailwind, but even in a tailwind, there are certain catalogs that will underperform. And so it's really important to look at each one as its own. And the best thing to do is within each, uh, within each listing under the financials tab, you'll find you know, the most recent performance sort of summarized by us within some charts and graphs that we do sort of uniformly across the listings, but you'll also find the raw data file for each of the catalogs and download that raw data file. And as, um, you know, uh, Ryan went through in some detail in the last uh, uh, investor office hours, which we can uh, share that recording if you don't have it already. Um, it's on our website, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, he goes through it and shows you, you know, puts it in a spreadsheet and shows you the way that he would look at it and essentially you know breaks it down by all the different sources and you know how they change over time and you can see those those trends so we know that the biggest tailwind is streaming growth and that's sort of the rising tide that's you know lifting 
almost all boats alone. So that's there. And if that's a big and growing portion of a particular catalog, that's a great sign. The longer it's been growing, the longer it's been around is a great sign. The longer it's been in an uptrend is a great sign. So, dollar age figures. And do, yeah, dollar age is a specific indicator for that. So I think the I think there's a lot of specific indicators about a particular catalog you want to look at. Um, if you haven't yet you know, bought one, I would just encourage you to watch a number of auctions before you actually invest anything. Look at, you know, look and see the way that other investors are pricing these in the, in the bidding. Um, you know, you can look at um, well over a hundred assets in the secondary market. Um, you know, as you can see lots of them that are, that are there right now that are available. And I think that just take your time to make sure you're making a, a smart decision. And, you know, for, for me personally, when I first got started in, in buying music royalties, small position size, something I was comfortable with, um, the way I would experiment when buying any new investment, you know, I would just take a small amount that I'm, that I'm I, you know, I'd consider I'm comfortable with an uncertain outcome associated with that investment. And, um, and just, just to get more familiar with the asset. So just don't, you know, don't ever invest in anything more than you can afford to lose until you become comfortable and sophisticated in understanding the asset class. Right. I mean, one of the, just to sum up the, the, the answer in that uh, the dollar age figure is a really important one because I think the way I've always introduced it is the fact that, you know, none of us here are experts as like, you know, A&R music industry people that can tell just by listening to a song, whether it's going to continue in popularity. We don't, you know, that's, that's the magic year, which frankly, I don't even think even exists in the music business, but um, that's why dollar age exists. If you, you've got something that has, that's been earning for a long period of time, it stands the test of time. It gives a degree of confidence that it that it's more likely to continue uh, the test of time going forward than something that has a low dollar age that hasn't yet proven itself. Still worth speculating on, looking at the different formats, things like that. Always adjust how much you know uh, you bid and things like that accordingly. But the dollar age figure, I think, is really the most important one is, uh, because of that. So, um, moving on. What is the best recommendation for investors from other countries uh, than the USA? Well, if you're really if you matters. are as long as you're not in a sanctioned country, a country that the U.S. forbids doing business with, then you can you can participate in our marketplace. It's not a problem. And um, you know, most of the royalties that are collected uh, on on the, the the assets that are sold in our marketplace are the royalties are collected worldwide, um, almost always. They're, they're worldwide royalties and collected and distributed um, here. So it doesn't it doesn't really matter where you're located, so long as you're not in North Korea or Iran or Cuba or wherever else sanctioned countries one thing i'll just note it's not exactly this the spirit of the question but i just want to note that when you're when you're looking at the assets available you're looking at, the, at which um distributor is collecting and distributing the the royalty so in many cases you'll you'll be looking at those from u.s based uh, distributors like ascap or bmi and in those you're going to see a line item that'll show the different sources of income and then you'll have one that just says international and it's worth noting that when it says international international is lumping all the different sources of royalties together into one lump some saying hey this came from out of the country so that could be streaming radio live TV, like everything kind of lumped together that just came from an international outlet is just in that one uh, category by itself. It makes it a, it's a little bit, I don't know, not yeah. difficult, but it's just, it's, it's different in terms of how you have to evaluate that. But that's, yeah, different. I mean, one thing I, I like to do, and obviously they're going to be a little different, but you can model it out as they have a similar breakdown as the domestic side, right? Um, so, the so, take, so it's a, so take the domestic breakdown and then apply that generally mm -hmm. to the, the international bulk payment. You can kind of get a general idea as to how it might, how it might source out. Yeah. It, right. And, and that's your baseline, right? Then adjust there. If you think it's going to stream more internationally, you know, tick that up a little bit. If it's going to do less, you know, tick that down. Right. Yeah. So when you see international as being the number one source of income, it's again, it's because it's taken all the other sources of income that are split into individual outlets in the U S and lumping together as the one. So you can see why that would happen. Yeah, All one right. other, <clears throat> one other um, item just on that though. So ASCAP BMI, they have gotten a lot better at providing us notes within the data um, fields that have, and our account management team, they're great. They'll list this if, if it happens, but um, just to look, you know, um, uh, they'll have notes, whether there was a large payment from a TV show or a large payment from a radio performance, that sort of thing. So it, it's certainly, it, it is very important to kind of look at the raw data on those as well. Okay. Uh, the next is, I think, possibly the best question we've ever been asked in the history of our office hour sessions, which is, how do I convince my wife that this is a good investment? 
Uh, let me start by saying that if you can convince your wife of anything, I think you should be hosting the webinar and having us ask you questions. Right, exactly. Uh, it's, it's <laughs> dumb, it's <laughs> but uh, I think the important thing is that I, I would just say that um, who knows, but I think that one of the misconceptions that people that um, you know your partner could have coming into this is that it's a it's a, it's a novelty item like a, a really expensive uh, concert t-shirt rather than as an actual investment. And so um, the, the merits of the income stream uh, is where I would focus. And if you're, you know, as you're looking at, especially if you look at all the other uh, investment opportunities that are available to you um, in terms of income generation in particular, music royalties are a rare find. And I think if you can show a long track record of income, you can show the, the growth in streaming, um, then, you know, you could probably make the case. But if, if, if your partner thinks that you're making another wild uh, spend on something that's silly, uh, then, you know, that's probably has more to do with the track record of other things you bought really than anything else. I'm just guessing. Because none of us have done that ever. No, no, definitely not. But no, but I, I, that's a good point. Like this, it's, it, 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 because it's music, there tends to be this, this idea that it's not serious. And, right. um, and I understand that, right? But, it's, uh, but the thing is there are solid, you know, very solid financial fundamentals behind or underneath these, these investments basically. And I think by focusing on that is, is really the best way to get around um, that initial assumption. Um, yeah, we made a decision very early on to uh, focus in one of two areas, focus on music as a speculation, so new music and new catalogs, or music as an income generating asset. And, and we made a very clear decision early on to focus on um, music royalties as an income generating asset, which means uh, royalty streams that already had a built in track record of income that would, while not wouldn't guarantee what would happen in the future, were indicative of what may happen in the future and certainly gave a basis for being able to value them properly. So uh, you know, we fundamentally stay away from the speculative piece of, of all this. Exactly. So moving on then, uh, is it possible to split and assign rights income from various different revenue streams? Um, Rob, you want to take a stab at that one? Yeah, yeah, no, I guess uh, feasibly, yes, it can, it can be done. You know, if, if, if you buy several different catalogs on royalty exchange, um, you know, if, if they're all paid by different distributors, it might be a little more difficult, but if, if royalty exchanges administering all the payments on your behalf, you own a, a certain bundle of rights and, and you could, could resell those, um, you know, if, if you wanted to in, in an auction. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, you know, most of the royalties that are sold in the marketplace already are, they are, uh, you know, if it's an, a if it's, if, if you're buying ASCAP royalties, for instance, you're buying just the public performance usually the songwriter share of the public performance. And that is a small portion of the overall revenue stream associated with the works. So there's a publishing side to it, you know, which includes some mechanical royalties. There's going to be a sound recording side to it. Um, you know, so there's a, there's a lot of other pieces there. So already it, everything that really you're buying at any time on royalty exchange is going to be an asset. It's going to be a slice of the overall royalty stream um, that's generated by a particular work. Right. Okay, this next one is actually two questions uh, with the same spirit. I'm going to read them both and we're, we'll answer them both together. So uh, in advance, we had one that said, how has the shutdown affected world royalty returns, particularly for public performance royalties? And then in the Q&A that's happened since we've been on the call today, has asked, how has the COVID lockdown affected royalties from historical run rates, in particular for streaming and public performance rates? Do we expect an ongoing impact? So let me start with this because I've been looking at this particularly myself. Um, it's hard to say, right? Will there be an impact? Absolutely, right? how much that's going to depend on what you what you acquire on the royalty exchange marketplace because some are are have less exposure to where the impact is occurring all right and so let me let me explain that um, generally from a public performance standpoint uh the the, the pro's performing rights organizations collect in a number of different ways and i'm not going to get all into it now because i could there is a, a a blog post that i could share if you guys uh, want to read into it in more detail but basically the, the, public, the sources of public performance income that are most affected are obviously live concerts, right? Because they're not, there aren't any, and uh, venues, uh, people that license for their bar, for their restaurant. So those are the two major areas of public performance royalties that are affected. And on a whole, like if you look at how, like to what percentage uh, uh, that, that um, 
contributes to what a PRO would play out in a given year, that's uh, substantial. It's a, anywhere between 15 to 20% of the distributions come from those two sources, but that has the PRO as a whole. And a lot of that is for the new music that's currently out and, and played today. What we've seen is that on royalty exchange, the assets that are available and that people are buying generally aren't as affected by those use cases. They're not played as much uh, in bars and restaurants perhaps, or they're just not a, an active touring ban any longer or, or anything like that. So what we did an analysis of all the um, uh, assets that are bought on our platform that we administer to our investors and took a look at from what source uh, those performance royalties generated their income and found that on each live and uh, the venue based ones, it was around 1% of the overall earnings that we distribute come from those two sources. So it's far less than the overall PRO one. Now that was just in the last one that we did. Okay. And it's also really important to note that there's a lag in terms of when the activity happens versus when the payment happens. And so we probably won't have a really good indication of this for at least six months, I would say, from an actual accounting basis to understand the cause and effect. That said, will it, will it, go, will it go down? Will some of it go down? Likely a little bit, um, but I think that it's probably gonna be a temporary, and these are, I think by nature, long-term investments. And, and be not as much as the, the general new release um, music um, that, that you yeah. don't typically get access to. So this that's is my part, long answer. Part of the advantage of us focusing on assets that have a longer track record of income, things with a greater dollar age, means that they're outside of that initial spike of revenue when a new popular popular music is released. And a significant portion of the performance royalties that are paid to, you know, by the for, for live performances and for these from the venues uh, is going toward those new releases. It's going toward those new releases. And because that's not generally the, the work that we're covering, then that, uh, whereas, it, as Anthony said, that makes up about 15% of total PRO distributions across the board within the assets within our marketplace, each one of them is about 1%. So um, it hasn't, we, we should, should the, the catalogs that are on our platform should be less affected than maybe the general market is we expect. And then on the other side, you know, on, on the, the streaming side, we haven't seen any indication really that streaming subscriptions are subsiding because of this. And, you know, that's the biggest, again, that's the bull market uh, that's driving um, the revenue growth within, within music is streaming. And that is not showing any signs of relenting. Right. So it just kind of goes back to what Ryan said earlier is that when you're evaluating uh, the investments to keep, a, keep an eye on what are the sources of those, of those royalties and trying to get an understanding as to what risk factors may, uh, may apply. So if, it is, you know, if it's mostly coming from streaming activity on Spotify or Apple or something like that, so far there's, there's not, there doesn't seem to be a, a disruption. And one last thing, just putting my old school journalism hat on here, like you know, one, the, the, the thing to, to not get wrapped up in too much is the the reporting on streaming activity that you see uh, reported on, like, oh, Spotify streams were down like overall. That's actually not very important. What's more important is keeping an eye on the overall number of paid subscriptions, right. paid subscriptions. That's really the thing. And we've seen that continually to go up. Um, if, if you know economic factors cause people to decide that $10 a month for music is outside their scope, that may change. I personally doubt that will happen. Others disagree with me, but you know, we'll see. Um, but so far, we haven't, we haven't seen any indication of that, of that happening. So Yeah, and let me just explain for people who don't know why that's important. Uh, artists are not paid on a per stream. They're paid on a, they're basically the pool of subscriptions, all the subscri subscribers, the, it's, it's put in a pool. And then uh, it's the, the royalties are essentially paid out on a market share basis. So if, uh, well, it's if a overall percent, it's a percentage of use basis. Yeah, percentage right. of use. So there's a little difference. Kind of market. Okay. okay, percentage of use. So on that basis, though, if there are, if there are collectively fewer streams, it has no. But you still have the same percentage of overall streams as an as a band. It's going to have zero impact um, on on your income. Like so, so the per stream income counts are, is totally irrelevant. Um, so I would just I would I would not focus on those at all. As Anthony says, the biggest thing is want to see want to see overall subscriber paid subscriber growth growing within uh, Spotify and the other streaming services. Right. And that's, that's a good thing if that keeps happening. Yeah, because the, as, the, as the subscriber base grows, that pool that's shared Bigger. grows. And so that 2% or whatever that you might get from that 
um, pool of money results in more money because it's 2% of the larger amount. And that's basically how it works. Yep. Okay, moving on. It's always fun. <laughs> uh, can I, as an independent artist, own shares of royalties and publishing? If you buy it on royalty exchange, sure. I, I think and as an independent sense. artist, you should you would own your own uh, publishing. Probably, just depends on yeah. I, I, it's kind of a hard question to answer, but um, basically, yes. Anybody who can come to our site and buy a share of the royalty stream that's that's available. Since we're talking about shares, let's let's move on to one that I that I think I missed. Was basically. Uh, comes down to rather than bidding or and buying a share outright of a catalog uh, is, is buying a, sh I'm sorry, rather than bidding and owning a, a part of a catalog directly is buying a share. And I think he means among others, a better approach. So that we're talking about the, secur the securitization of, of having multiple people buy a share of yeah. one catalog as opposed to one person buying that whole share of the catalog. Yeah, this is a question we get all the time and people want to go, you know, can I, can I just buy a, a part of this rather than buy the entire thing? And um, when you do that, when you basically take a single asset and you divide it up into lots of uh, share units, essentially, and allow, make that available to uh, a number of people, it becomes a security as, you know, as, a deter as um, defined, defined by, by the SEC. So it, it, it falls under a whole body of regulation that, uh, that asset sales like this do not have. So it, and it would actually make this totally unworkable if these were, if we tried to do these on a securities basis. Um, so, so all, every transaction, uh, almost every single transaction that's ever, we've ever engaged in has been um, an asset sale from a single seller to a single buyer. And uh, that really is the only workable way for these, for these assets to, to be transacted. Um, mm -hmm. We have on a couple of occasions, three in total done private syndicates and essentially for those uh, accredited investors um, sort of pool a little bit of capital together to own a, a, a large asset, a larger asset. We've done it with a Dire Straits catalog, Cage the Elephant catalog, and an M&M catalog. And, um, but it's not, we've only done it a few times. We haven't done it in a couple of years. Um, it, opportunistically, we may do some in the future, but uh, it's our primary business is just uh, bringing great assets into the marketplace and allowing individuals or you know, companies or hedge funds or whoever are bidding on these things to be able to, to buy them directly. So single owner or single seller to a single buyer. And uh, perfect timing since you brought up the fact that we have done a handful of private syndicates in the past. The next question is, can, this one is asking specifically about the M&M syndication shares be sold? And if so, how does that work? So if, if, if an investor had uh, participated in a previous private syndicate, and if they wanted to sell the, the share that they, shares that they acquired, how could they do so? Rob, do you want to answer that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, all of the, the LLC units that were sold as part of those private placements um, had to be held for a, a year because they were restricted securities. Um, so there's no public market for them. Um, for a royalty exchange to be able to facilitate that, we would have to be a broker dealer. Uh, we are not. So what, what we can do is if you are an owner uh, of the M&M uh, asset, or any, or any of one of the shares or, or any of the, the LLCs, you can contact us. Um, you can give us your name and, and whether you're interested in buying or selling. What we can do is, is basically create some sort of white pages for um, interested buyers and sellers to connect with each other. We have to stay hands off in that uh, transaction, but at least it's a mechanism for, for you to express interest one way or the other. Yeah. Now I would say if you have, if you know somebody who is interested in buying the interest from you, um, that's great. That's fine. And, uh, and just let us know and we can help facilitate that the transfer of those units according to the terms of the operating agreement, which are, which are flexible on that. But, uh, um, you know, you do have the ability to sell these units after holding them for one year to, to really any party uh, that you can find. We just cannot create a market for those um, without being a, a broker dealer, which we don't right. want to be. Right. So then the last question that's in the, uh, the Q&A that came in uh, during the call, uh, and I'm going to read this. I don't understand the full question, but I believe Ryan uh, and Matt, this, this would be for you guys. So the question here is, any recommendation on how much should royalties make up of my overall financial investment portfolio? Today, some, port I'm sorry, some financial portfolio managers use beta 
parentheses volatility as criteria criteria to determine how much capital to invest. I see dollar age as a proxy of volatility or beta in equity markets. Am I thinking of this properly? Ryan? Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, we're not going to be able to recommend for anybody specific portfolio yeah. at all. What, mm -hmm. don't know. What's I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I think you're thinking dollar age is probably a, a good proxy for kind of the volatility. I mean, royalties are going to jump around, you know, a lot, a lot more than say some of your other investments um in terms of the quarterly to quarterly distributions yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um I, like like matt said it's hard to kind of give a, a recommendation for how much it should be of your portfolio but i mean if you're if you can take on more risk you can certainly own more royalties if you want to take on less risk i i don't you know less yeah i think that i mean i'll just i is I have no idea what's appropriate for anyone else um, at all. I mean, I really can't say, uh, just, you know, there's, there's a, any financial advisor would tell you there's a whole bunch of different factors that go into considering, you know, how much, what your asset allocation should look like. Um, you know, for me personally, uh, I, I would feel comfortable owning, you know, 10 to 15% of, of my assets in royalties because um, partially because uh, I wouldn't want to own a lot more because income is not the primary you know, I'm, I'm more uh, as a relatively younger guy, I'm still interested in the growth side of things more than the income side. And these are really, these are really income assets at the end mm -hmm. of the day, they're income assets. So, um, you know, but uh, certainly there is a, there is a non-correlated uh, uh, nature of these to the stock market, which um, especially the way the stock market is, uh, you know, has been behaving recently with everything that's going on and with the you know, economic impacts that might ultimately trickle down to the stock market in some way, uh, you know, you expect more volatility there. So it inclined me personally to be more interested in alternative assets than, than I might've been six months ago. All right, well, those are all the questions. I do wanna, uh, I'm gonna share my screen real quickly to kind of point folks to uh, where they can uh, access some additional uh, information and also uh, in particular past, um, versions of this of these office hours so i'm sharing real quickly this is a shot of the royalty exchange blog you see the blog up here in the upper right part of the menu um, we have several different blogs so uh, when you scroll down this basically you're going to see an area called investor resources right and in the investor resources area you're going to see a lot of different options and if you go to the marketplace webinars link here you'll be able to see these are these are where we post the recordings of all of our office hour sessions you can go through and uh, listen to, if you wanna to go to, to the April 14th one, it's just right there embedded, there's me. Just click, click play and you'll be able to hear it. I, I'm going to try to, um, when I have time, a little bit more time, add uh, some summaries text-wise to, to underneath this. Uh, but for now, this, they're, they're the, uh, the raw full video file of these and, the, and this one will be added to the same place uh, there as well. So we have those available to you. And, uh, and again, you also have a lot of other things here like, um, You've got some investor guides that kind of go over the details of how music royalties work. Uh, there's a nice new video we added about how, you know, an introduction to royalties and royalty exchange and how they all work together. Uh, some different uh, guides and informational articles about dollar age and how to separate signal from noise and things like that. So I, I encourage you to kind of go through here and take a look at all the different resources that we've put up. Uh, there's quite a bit there that can, that can help you, I think, uh, answer a lot of these questions. And then of course, there's, there's always just the news section if you want to kind of try to keep up if you're not into the music uh, business and you want to keep up on what's happening i compile a um a weekly uh list of headlines uh this is the most recent one that's going to go out later today actually you're getting the sneak peek uh but you can you can kind of just see here are the different articles that are being written about uh, the current state just basically any headlines that i think are important for for anyone who's who's investing in royalties to want to you know stay up on the news and whatnot so i'll, I'll just end with that um, so that's it. I don't think we have any other questions. Uh, any closing thoughts from the panels? Nope. Just want to thank everybody for participating. I always enjoy the questions and uh, the opportunity to interact with you guys. So thank you for yeah. joining us today. All right. Great. Thank you. And again, we're moving to an every other week schedule. So uh, none next week, but then again, the week after. Okay. Thanks everyone. Look for the recording and we'll talk again soon. Bye now. Thanks. Thanks.